Jane, an old friend from nearby Tacoma, Washington, wrote to me after watching the episode that I titled What Effectively Confronting Bigotry Ultimately Requires. She wanted me to clarify a point I made there. In the piece, I noted that a common trap when a person's thinking stops short of culturally mature perspective is the equating of equality with equivalence. She particularly wanted clarification with how this relates to questions of gender. It's a great kind of question because it brings attention to the importance of thinking much more complexly about identity politics related questions than people on either the right or the left are likely to do when it comes to efforts like the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter. In particular, it highlights the importance of distinguishing distinguishing between changes that are products of different points in culture's evolutionary story. In this case, of the modern age product project on one hand, and cultural maturity's more specifically integrative task on the other. Where this takes us requires more nuanced and extended reflections than most topics I've touched on here, but it helps highlight how sophisticated our thinking needs to be with these kinds of questions if the result is not just going to be uh, even greater misunderstanding. A quick reference to dynamics that relate more to race than to gender helps make the kind of trap I'm referring to concrete. With today's left progressive woke politics, people tend to assume that if there is racial inequality, it must be a product of discrimination. Very often, it quite specifically is. But assuming this is the case confuses equality with equivalence and can lead to some pretty nutty conclusions. A simple thought experiment turns the tables on the usual situation. The larger number of athletes in the NBA and the NFL are black. Given the disparity we see is the logical explanation bigotry against whites. I would have liked to play in the NBA. I would, suggest, I would suggest instead that most often we were seeing real differences in ability. We certainly were with me. Creative systems theory addresses why we might see these differences, but for our purposes, the important recognition is simply that they appear to be real. I'm also comfortable saying that when we fall for this kind of conceptual trap, we get in the way of finding solutions for these situations where there are real problems. So let's turn to Jane's more particular interest in how all of this might relate to gender. In my book on the evolution of intimacy, I make an observation from creative systems theory that is critical to understanding the particular nature of current gender related changes. The theory proposes that what we see today involves two fundamentally different kinds of change dynamics. Some of what we see can best be thought of as a culminating expression of modern age developmental dynamics, the kind of change that gave us the Bill of Rights and efforts toward equal rights and equal opportunity that have followed in the centuries since. Here the task is equality. But just as important ultimately are changes that reflect the new realities that come with culturally mature understanding. Here, appreciating differences becomes as important as recognizing similarities. We can learn a lot from reflecting on these different kinds of change processes and how they interplay. The concept of gender archetype provides a way in. 
The notion has been best articulated in modern times by psychiatrist Carl Jung and will be familiar to many people with a psychological background. Jung proposed that we each have more masculine and more feminine aspects and described how we see the workings of these counterpoised forces in fairy, fairy tales and myth in spiritual practice and philosophical thought. I draw on the language of gender archetype in describing these qualities to avoid confusing tendencies in this sense with the common assumption that some qualities are male and others female. Again, men and women each embody both kinds of tendency. A man or a woman might have more archetypally masculine or more archetypally feminine characteristics regardless of their gender. And depending on their personality style, the balance in a man may be more archetypally feminine than in the average woman, and that in a woman more archetypally masculine than in the average man. There are simpler ways to talk about what I am, with what I am calling archetypally masculine and archetypally feminine. For example, I often speak of more right hand and more left hand psychological aspects. We could also use more everyday language and talk about qualities that are harder and softer. But the language of gender archetype, besides helping us think with particular nuance about differences, also points toward Essential conceptual insights. Creative systems theory highlights the important recognition that there is something inherently procreative in how polar opposites relate and ultimately in how human understanding is structured. This way of thinking helps clar clarify an essential observation critical to making sense of the absolute gender beliefs of times past. Historically, we've confused gender with gender archetype. More precisely, our concepts of gender have been based on projected, idealized, mythologized archetypal images and qualities. In On the Evolution of Intimacy, I describe how creative systems theory maps how our beliefs about gender differences through time have reflected the particular ways that gender archetype has manifested and been projected at specific points in the evolution of culture. It helps with history. But we're left with making sense of just how our picture of gender and gender differences changes with culturally mature perspective. What do we find when we step beyond the past's projections and mythologizings? One part of creative systems theory's answer is that we become better able to recognize how men and women each do embody both archetypally masculine and archetypally feminine characteristic. Using our box of crayons image with whole person identity, we better appreciate the fact that men and women each have both archetypally and feminine aspects. In today's world, that observation is unlikely to provoke much controversy. But there's a second kind of observation where this is not the case. It concerns gender differences. I've described how modern age advances with particular emphasis in equality. In contrast, culture mature perspective is careful not to, not to confuse equality and equivalence. While cultural maturity's more systemic picture emphasizes that men and women are more similar than we have tended to assume in times past, at the same time, it helps us better appreciate real difference. Today, the simple recognition that we might find normative differences between men and women can be controversial. Contemporary academic thought with its postmodern leanings can claim that psychological differences, if they exist at all, are, pro are products only of conditioning, of the different ways boys and girls are raised. Indeed, it is possible in academia today to lose one's job simply for suggesting the existence of differences of a more fundamental sort. But the fact of real differences 
really seems obvious to most people. Very few people who spend much time around young children, for example, would find the conclusion that all we need is upbringing to explain apparent differences not at all persuasive. So just how are men and women in fact different if they are at all? At the least, we still live in different kinds of bodies. Given how the different strokes for different folks, assumptions of postmodern belief and related techno notions can each point toward is what is, in effect, a disembodied future, the fact that we have different kinds of bodies might seem of diminishing significance. But this can't ultimately be our direction going forward. A key characteristic of cultural maturity's cognitive changes is that they help us get more in touch with the body as experience. We gain further insight by turning to the question of relative balance. Necessarily here we are dealing with generalities, but it turns out these are generalities that can be useful. Well, we find greater individual variation once we step behind, beyond polarized expectations, we also recognize normative differences. I think of about a 60-40 balance relative to gender. Men, on average, tend to embody a bit more of the archetypally masculine. Women tend, on average, to embody a bit more of the archetypally feminine. A simple way to see this 60-40 balance is to look at men's and women's bodies. Note that vertically men tend to carry their center of balance somewhat higher in the body, in the chest and shoulders, and women somewhat lower in the pelvis and thighs. More horizontally, even with the same amount of exertion and conditioning, men's bodies tend to be a bit harder to the touch and women's a bit softer. A person could dismiss these, dismiss these observation as just physical, but as creative systems makes clear, the notion that anything is just physical is much more a product of our time and culture than how things actually work. Any psychological concept within creative systems theories, culture, mature formulations is in the end a mind-body concept. Some of the writers who are most often cited by students of women's issues make reference to this kind of difference. For example, in her powerfully influential book, In a Different Voice, psychologi psychologist Carol Gilligan, drawing on her studies of moral development in children, spoke of male experience in terms of a self defined more through separation and female experience in terms of a self defined more by connection. Linguist Deborah Tannen reached similar conclusions in her best-selling book, You Just Don't Understand, Women and Men in Conversation, in contrasting how women are more apt to use communication to establish social bonds and men are more apt to use communication to solve problems. While this recognition of normative differences requires that we think in ways that we not be used to, used to it can also be powerfully freeing. It takes us beyond both history's polarized expectations and unisex notions that in their own ways can be just as constraining. Suddenly, our gender options become multitude, and our task in relationship to gender becomes new and clear, newly clear and obvious to simply be as authentically ourselves as we are able. This way of thinking about gender differences get us, gets us beyond much of what before that has been controversial, but it doesn't escape controversy. I've noted that simply claiming that differences exist can be controversial in some circles. And implications with regard to more specific gender-related questions can arouse intense feelings even amongst those who might not have any difficulty with the basic conclusion that I've proposed. Current debates about equality in the workplace provide a good example. 
equal opportunity and equal pay for equal work are unquestionably important goals. But we often hear it implied that the only possible explanation if we find gender differences in a profession is discrimination. And again, very often discrimination is the major factor. But the recognition that we see normative differences also opens the door to other possibilities. For example, it, su it suggests that choice, too, may play a role. Some jobs are going to be more appealing to those with more of the archetypally masculine in their makeup, others more attractive to those whose most manifest the archetypally feminine. That will be the case for both men and women. But if the idea of a 60-40 normative balance is accurate, there are going to be normative differences too in the jobs men and women are drawn to. 50 years from now, differences should be less extreme than what we see today, and certainly much less extreme than we have seen historically. But even if discrimination with regard to job opportunity is totally eliminated, in most professions, discrepancies will likely remain. I suspect we will still see more men firefighters and race car drivers and nurses and teachers of young children will likely still more often be women. This kind of observation has implications beyond just job preference. It extends to how a person's balance of more archetypally masculine and archetypally feminine char characteristics may influence more general life choices. In the early episode, I mentioned a surprising outcome we find in Nordic countries where gender equality is highest and best supported by social policy that's provocative in this regard. We find fewer women senior business managers, not more. It appears that when women are given more choices, many will find the rat race not where they want to spend their lives. Framing these results in terms of gendered archetype helps get beyond thinking only in terms of men and women. It may be that when people with more of the archetypally feminine in their, in their makeup are given more choices, they may choose a different kind of life. These reflections on gender, the workplace, and more general life choices provide good examples of how culturally mature perspective confronts ideological correctnesses of both the political left and the political right. Those on the left are likely to bristle at any suggestion that differences are not simply a product of discrimination. Those on the right are more likely to feel that there is something sacred in traditional roles. Framing what we see in terms of gender archetype and cultural evolution offers the possibility of thinking in more nuanced ways. The creative systems theory personality typologies, typologies recognition that personality style differences reflect different balances and relationships of archetypal qualities further fills out this picture by helping us better think in terms of actual individual variation. In another way, we confront a topic that in today's world easily becomes polarized and tediously complex, but that with the addition of culturally mature perspective ends up feeling pretty common sense. It requires that we think in more nuanced ways, but in the end, it is only about, common, about what common sense experience becomes when we are embodied beings. Further questions are always appreciated.